Good evening, New Beginning Church and our online family and friends. We want to just thank you so much for coming on tonight. Our scripture will come from Psalm 86, verse 6 through 10. That's Psalm 86, verses 6 through 10. And it reads, Give ear, O Lord, to my prayer, and attend to the voice of my supplications. In the day of my trouble, I will call on you, for you will answer me. Verse 8 says, Among the gods, there is none like you, O Lord, nor are there any works like your works. All nations whom you have made shall come and worship before you, O Lord, and shall glorify your name. For you are great and do wondrous things. You alone are God. You alone are God. Father God, that we do realize that you are the only true and the only mighty God. We thank you, Lord, that you blessed us again to even realize that there is none like you. There is no God like you. There is no person like you. There is no creation like you. You are God and you are God alone. We thank you, Father God, that we can come tonight and celebrate your goodness, your mercy, and your grace. We thank you, God, that you not, not only have mercy, you not only have grace, but God, you've given us favor one more time. And for that, Lord, we thank you. We bless your name. We honor your Father. We thank you for who you are and for what you do. Lord, we ask you to bless us, Father God, that we will hear from you. Hear from you through your word. Bless your word to fall on good soil. And bless your word tonight, Father God, that your word will go forward. Their lives will be changed and we will be made to better. We ask you to keep the glory, all the honor and all the praise, allow us to be beneficiaries of your many blessings. Send the strong, mighty, anointed, powerful name of Jesus the Christ, we pray, and we ask it all. Amen and thank God. No one else can touch my heart like you. We have found there is none. There is none like you. Hallelujah to the Lamb. Hallelujah to the Lamb, the Lamb of God. Thank God again for another.
privilege, another honor, another opportunity to honor the conquering king of Calvary. His name is Jesus. Amen. Amen. His name is Jesus the Christ. We thank God for another chance. Tonight, we're going to throw some more words at you. We're going to talk about biblical interpretation tonight. We're going to talk about biblical interpretation. Biblical interpretation. We're still dealing with hermeneutics, how we approach the word, how we look at the word, how we deal with the word, how we understand the word. And so when we deal with hermeneutics, first of all, we talked about we must have observation. So tonight we're going to talk about interpretation. Amen? Observation and now interpretation. So we walk through Mark chapter 5. For about three weeks or four weeks, three weeks, yes. About three weeks we walked through Mark chapter 5 and we dove into it and we discovered you just can't look at a passage and just run with it. Our teachers have confessed tonight, on, on several other nights rather, that they don't do the Saturday night special. The Saturday night special is when you get to Saturday night and say, oh, I'm teaching tomorrow. And start getting your notes and getting things done that you didn't get done all week long. I said to you that a teacher or a preacher may spend 20 to 24 hours preparing for just a 30 minute to 45 minute sermon or teaching session. Yes? So tonight we're going to talk about biblical interpretation. Write these words down and give some space for definitions as you write it down. First of all, exegesis. That word is spelled E-X-E-G-E-S-I-S. -E -E exegesis. E-X-E-G-E-S-I-S. -E -E exegesis. The opposite of exegesis is called eisegesis. Eisegesis is spelled E-I-S-E-G-E-S-I-S. -E -E Eisegesis, E-I-S-E-G-E-S-I-S. -E -E -S -S. That's S. Again, eisegesis is E-I-S-E-G-E-S-I-S. -E -E -S -S. Exegesis is e x E G E S I X. Two other words that are common to each other we're going to deal with is translation and transliteration. Translation and transliteration. Translation and transliteration. Translation is spelled T R A N. S-L-A-T-I-O-N. Translation. T-R-A-N-S. L-A-T-I-O-N. That's translation. Transliteration. T-R-A-N-S. L-I-T-E-R-A-T-I-O-N. Transliteration. Transliteration again, T-R-A-N-S-L-I-T-E-R-A-T-I-O-N, transliteration. And the first word we're going to deal with before we get to these four words is called word study. Word study. Word is spelled W-A-R-D. W-O-R-D, W-O-R-D, word. If I can mess it up, anybody can mess it up, right? I'm the one telling the story. W-O-R-D, S-T-U-D-Y, word study. So we're going to begin tonight with word study. I'm just going to give you a very, very small piece of word study because it's very extensive. First of all, word study, in word study, we look at a word that's listed in the text. When we look at that word, we go back to our previous notes and we look at words like verbs, 
nouns, pronouns, adjectives, adverbs, prepositions, participles, all those things you were taught in eighth grade. We're looking at parts of speech, right? So the two most famous are verbs and nouns. What's a verb? The same thing that it is in English is the same thing it is in the Bible. Okay, what's the verb? A verb shows action or conjunction, junction. What's your function? Come on. Remember the days. A verb is a shows a state of being or an action. A verb shows a state of being or an action. What's a noun? Person, place, or thing. Person, place, or thing is a noun. What's an adjective? It modifies the noun. What's an adverb? It modifies the adverb. Prepositions are words like above, beneath, for. So we're good, right? So we're going to deal with strictly verbs and, and nouns, okay? Every verb today didn't mean the same thing 2,000 years ago. Every noun today did not mean the same thing 2,000 years ago. So we have to do our word study, meaning we got to look up that word, look at what the word means, and look at how the word is used. When we do our word study, let's go first of all to 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verse 15, one that's common to all of us in the room. 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verse 15. The Apostle Paul is giving us hope. The Apostle Paul is giving us so much hope until he said, don't even concern yourself in sorrow as if someone who has died have no hope. Don't sorrow as if you have no hope and if those who died in Christ has no hope. Have no hope. The Apostle Paul begins verse 13 and goes to verse 18, and he encourages us. He said, I would not have you to be ignorant. King James says, I would not have you to be ignorant, brethren. First of all, he says, be informed. You're not ignorant because you're informed. He says, be informed. Then he says, I would not that you be ignorant, brother, concerning those who are asleep. Those who have died in Christ. He says, don't worry about it. Yeah, you're going to sorrow. Yeah, you're going to be upset. Yeah, you're going to mourn. But don't mourn and be in sorrow as if you have no hope. He goes on to say, those who have died in Christ, they shall rise again. When you get to verse number 15, he says to us tonight, he says that those who, who are still alive will not prevent those who are asleep. My word tonight is prevent. We're looking at the key word prevent. These are key words, right? This is a verb. So he looks at the word prevent, and when we get to the word present, prevent, if we look at it in the 21st century, this word prevent makes no sense with the text. It doesn't even, even get into spirituality. It doesn't even get into us as non-spiritual creatures. Remember, in order for the text to be true, the whole text has to be true. God never contradicts himself. The word of God never contradicts itself. So when we look at this word prevent, it says that those of us who remain in a lie shall not prevent those who are asleep. Now look at the subject matter. The subject matter is that we're going to rise again. The subject matter is to be informed. The subject matter is to be encouraged. The subject matter is those who died in Christ shall rise again. When he gets to verse number 15, he says to us, all of us, that we should not prevent those who are asleep. So we're looking at the word prevent. The word prevent in the new 
21st century means what? What does the word prevent mean? What does the word prevent mean? Stop, stop. Stop or to, hinder. to stop or to hinder. To hold back, right? So if it means to stop or to hinder or to hold back, we know something about this word that we got to investigate. You see, when you're doing biblical interpretation, when you're doing biblical hermeneutics, you become an investigator. How many of you old enough to know who Columbo was? Yeah. No? Yeah. Okay. Who's the latest one? Give me another. Give me a modern day Columbo. Jane Madison? That rings a bell. Okay. Uh, Hawaii 5 -0. Huh? I know they remade it. That's about the same time as Columbo. Oh my goodness. I'm, I'm really old enough. Okay, let me explain who Columbo was. I'm so glad we got young people in our church. Hallelujah. Columbo was a private investigator. And Columbo would show up on the scene. He was a detective. He would show up on the scene after everything is done with, after the police officers had written their reports, Columbo will show up and he will launch his investigation. And when he launched his investigation, he always would find something that the reporting officers never found. Columbo came to his conclusion because he was looking for clues. And when he looked for clues, he always found something that incriminated somebody that was going to get away with the murder or get away with the theft or get away with the murder. Columbo would be all down on the floor and all down on the ground with a flashlight. And all of a sudden, he'll pick up a paper clip. Now, that paper clip meant nothing to police officers. It's in office. That's what paper clips ought to be. But Columbo would walk down there, he would crawl on the ground, he would crawl on the floor, and he would put his pen down there, and he would raise up a paper clip. And he had a magnifying glass. And when he raised up this paper clip, he would take a sigh of relief. Aha. How many people know who Sherlock is? Anybody? Everybody. Oh, we're on the same page. And so what, what would happen when you deal with Sherlock, what would happen is this guy come up with a, with a great, he would come up with a great conclusion and his partner would look at him, no joke, Sherlock. In other words, what you just found meant nothing. We could see that on the surface. So you haven't found anything. But when Columbo came on the scene, he would always find something that no one else could find. You know why they have canine dogs with police officers? Because the dog can smell, can taste, can sense stuff that humans cannot sense. As Christians, as students of the word, we have to become the modern day Columbo and investigate so deeply, dig so deeply until we find stuff that make people say, aha. Let's look. Someone read that text in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verse 15 for us, please. Uh, King James, preferably. Preferably. King James. 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verse 15. Who's reading? King James. King James, please. For this we say unto you, by the word of the Lord, that we which are alive and remain until the coming of the Lord shall not prevent them which are asleep. Okay? He says, shall not prevent those who are asleep. Now, years ago, when I was in seminary, the first few years, we would carry this book. It calls the Strong, Strong's Concordance. We carry this book. Keyword Hebrew Greek Study Bible. We would carry another book, 
This one is called an emphasized Bible. And then there's an interliterary Bible that we would carry. And then we got the expository Bible. And each one of these Bibles do different things, but it comes to the same conclusion. So let's take the Strong's Concordance. The reason why I'm not a fan of um, commentaries is because you got to do your own work, right? So when we look up this word in the strong concordance, you got to find the word in the book. And when you look up the word prevent, when you look up the word prevent, you find it in the book. And once you find it, then you got to determine whether it's Hebrew or Greek. Yes? yes? This is in the New Testament, so we know it's what? Yes? yes? Sure? Anybody sure? So we would turn this book and we would look it up and we would find the word prevent. And once we find the word prevent, then we know it's in the Greek. And since we know it's in the Greek, then we go to the back of the book and find the Greek and then we zero in on the word. And when we get to the Greek, it will give us a number. And that's called the strong number. And we would have to do that for every single word. And I have my notes from 1995, and we did the book, the book of Psalms. I didn't say the, the number of Psalms. We did Psalms number one through Psalm 150, just like this, using this book. And when we had a homework assignment, we, I mean, we lived in this book. You would find the word. Then you will find it in the Greek. Then you will find the number. Then you will turn from that number and find that number. And then it will give you the meaning. And it will give you the usage. But now we've been empowered. We have all four of these books on a tablet, an iPad, or a phone. How many of you have something similar to the uh, uh, Sword Bible, my Sword Bible? Well, you can punch a, punch a number, the strong number, and it'll give you the definition. Everything in front of the semicolon is definition and, and meaning, and everything after the semicolon tells you how it's used in the script, in the sentence, or in the text, right? So the word here is prevent. It would take just for that one verse, and I do every noun and every verb, not even worrying about the pronouns, the adjectives, the adverbs, it would literally take me two hours to get through that one passage. And then I got to go back and, and check myself. And so when you get to 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verse 15, the word is prevent. It doesn't fit, does it? We shall not. First of all, we don't have the power of stopping anybody from going to heaven. Secondly, we can't hold them back because God did not give us the power to do that either. So this word prevent ought to get your attention. Okay, now someone stand and read in another version. Tell me what version you read in before you stand and read it. Brother Whitlock has read King James. And it says, those of us who remain should not prevent those who are asleep. Those who are asleep. This word sleep means what? Dead. So who's that? Brother Mouth. We shall not prevent those who are asleep. Yes, sir. Uh, New King James. For this we say to you by the word of the Lord, that we who are alive and remain until the coming of the Lord will by no means precede those who are asleep. Look at what he says. He says, proceed. He left out the word prevent. Is something wrong with his Bible? He replaced it. With the no. He replaced it. Right? Who has a different version than New King James? Other than King James. Who has a different version? So all of us on one accord here, right? Yeah, give me another verse. <laughs> give me New American Standard. Give me International Children Bible. NASB. NASB. First Thessalonians chapter 4, verse 15. For we say this to you by the word of the Lord, 
that we who are alive and remain until the coming of the Lord will not precede those who have fallen asleep. Will not precede those who have fallen asleep. Who has a different version? Uh, this is the RCV, New Children's Translation. Um, what we tell you now is the Lord's own message. We who are living now may still be living when the Lord comes again. We who are living at that time will be with the Lord, but not before those who have already died. Okay, we won't go before. So this word pre prevent means to proceed. We will not proceed. We will not uh, go before. Anybody else has another version? Any other version? We not we have King James, NASB. ESV. Give me ESV. ESV. First Thessalonians chapter four, verse number fifteen. Well, this we declare to you by a word from the Lord, that we who are alive, who are left until the coming of the Lord, will not precede those who have fallen asleep. Amen. So we will not proceed. We will not go before. This word doesn't mean hinder. I, I've heard it preached and taught. Oh, we won't be able to hold them back. People shouting all over the place. They are celebrating. Oh, we won't be able to hold them. Well, you can't hold them back either way. That ought not be, be a, a, a something that you'll come to the conclusion of, Sherlock. We are a modern day, we are modern day Columbos. We're looking for clues. We're looking, we're digging deep into the text. We are making sure that we don't lie on God. And whenever you don't say it the way God says it, you're lying on God. Whenever it doesn't mean what God says it means, you're lying on God. How many of you want to lie on God? Just one time to get by, make make folks feel good, fuzzy, and, and feeling good. I told you before, I talked to the brother, after he got through preaching, I talked to him, I said, man, hey, you know, you, you kind of missed it. What do you mean? You talked about Isaiah chapter 6, and you closed, and it sounds good. I mean, folks, they love to hear that part. Oh, when I leave here, I'm going to have six wings. Two wings to veil my face. Two wings to veil my feet. And two wings with which I will fly. Oh man, that just turned folk out. And don't let him sing a little bit. I know he's all right. I know he's all right. Let me just share with you. We have to say it the way God has said it. I said, man, you, you know, the wings are not for people. The wings were seraphims. The wings were for angels. The wings were for those flying around the throne of God. He said, oh, man, that ain't no problem. The people like it. You see how they shout it on Whew, Lord have mercy. So, when we look at 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verse 15, we look at the word prevent, what do we see? What, do we, what have we realized tonight? Let me put it that way. But the word prevent means to proceed. word translated as prevent means to proceed. Right. We will not proceed those who are, are, have gone asleep. And if we look at the word sleep, we, we realize that it means dead. But the reason why God and Jesus uses the word, use the word sleep is because those of us who know God, we going to wake up again. Jesus said to Mary and Martha, Lazarus is not dead. He is asleep. He's going to wake up again. He's going to be resurrected. And guess what? When, when Jesus says that, Martha says, I know he's going to be resurrected in the resurrection. Jesus says, I am the resurrection. You standing in the presence of resurrection right now. 
I am the resurrection. He's just sleeping. And guess what? All of the Old Testament saints that died in God, they just sleep. Pastor Love Lady did his brother's funeral about a week or so ago, two weeks ago, and he began his his whole service by talking about my brother. Don't talk about him in past tense because he still is. He talked about the fact that when somebody dies in Christ, you don't have to say they had a good life. They still have a good life. Matter of fact, now they have a better life. I mean, he just took his time and laid out the fact that, yes, he is dead on this side. Yes, he no longer live on this side. But he's not dead. He's asleep. And he, he wrapped it all up by saying, when you go to sleep, you're going to wake up. So your brother went to sleep on this side and woke up on the other side. Good God Almighty. And he has a mansion just his style. And so when we look at this thing, we have to understand that God has a way of blessing us. And when he blesses us, he says that we don't have to worry about the fact that there are some who have died before us. So St. Henry says this word prevent means ahead, meaning that we won't be able to go ahead of them. Are you with me? So we ought to, we ought to rejoice. We, we put on the program that we have a celebration of life. If we celebrate, why are we weeping like we have no hope? We ought to sure enough celebrate. Sometimes because we're just selfish and we want to keep the person here, and I understand. But we ought to celebrate. We ought to come in the door. We ought to do what the psalmist say. Before we get on the parking lot, we ought to be celebrating. Before we come through the gate, we ought to be celebrating. Before we come into the courtroom, into the, the holy uh, sanctuary, we ought to be celebrating. Because we believe this story. That he's just asleep. She's just asleep. And you don't even have to worry about talking about you're going to see him again. When you leave here, you're not going to worry about who you see other than Jesus. I want to see Jesus. The one who has died and rose for me. I want to see Jesus. Your relationship up there won't be the same as it is here anyway. That's why we have to treat people, our loved ones, right down here. So we can get our reward over there. We don't have to worry about seeing them. It sounds good when we're preaching and says, good night, I'll see you in the morning. Sounds good. But if I say good night down here, I want to see Jesus in the morning. Yes? Okay, now there's, we're going to look at the word power. We're still talking about word study. We're still talking about exegeting, eisegeting. We're still talking about translating and transliterating. Let's look at the word power. Acts chapter 1 verse 7 and Acts chapter 1 verse 8. Acts chapter 1 verse 7 Acts chapter 1 verse 8. Sister Whitlock. Acts chapter 1 verse 7 uh, Sister Woods. Acts chapter 1 verse 8. In the New Testament the book is Acts. The Acts of the Apostles. The chapter is 1. The verses are 7 and 8. Who has verse 7? All right. And he said to them, It is not for you to know times or seasons which the Father has put in his own authority. Mm, she messed up. She told my story. King James, Brother Whitlock, can you pull up King James, hand it over to your wife, and let her use it for it for me, please? Acts chapter 1, verse 7. No, I didn't say it up front. <laughs> Thank you. King James. And he said unto them, It is not for you to know 
the times or the seasons which he which the Father has put in his own power. Power is the word we're looking for, right? So we the word power here. Who has the, the Greek word and can pronounce it almost? What is the word power? What is the word power in verse 7? And then, just Woods, read Acts chapter 1, verse number 8. In the King James Version, please. Acts chapter 1, verse number 8, King James. I guess we don't use King James here that much. But I'm just trying to make a point that we have to make sure we say what God is saying. We have to say it the way God has said it. We have to understand it the way the author has written it. Acts chapter, Sister Davis, uh, Psalm 27. In Psalm 27, we're looking at the word salvation. Yes, ma'am. Psalm 27 is the next verse. King James, please, please, ma'am, please, sir. Yes, ma'am. But ye shall receive power after that the Holy Ghost is come upon you, and ye shall be witness unto me, both in Jerusalem and in all of Judea and in Samaria, and unto the uttermost part of the earth. Okay. So there, there are two two different verses that uses the same word power. Brother Whitlock, you there. You have Acts 1 and 7, Acts 1 and 8. We're looking at the, the Greek word for power. The Greek word for power. And then you can tell me the definition of it. Sister Davis, Psalm 27, 1. Psalm 27, 1. Psalm 27 and 1 in the King James Version. The Lord is my light and my salvation. Whom shall I fear? The Lord is the strength of my life. Of whom shall I be afraid? The word is salvation. When, I want everybody to think about this. When we use the word salvation, what are we talking about? When we use the word salvation, what are we talking about? What does the word salvation mean? Saved. Saved. Anybody else? Deliverance. Yeah. Deliverance. Anybody else? Freed. Set free. So look at this word. We're still working on verses 1 and 7. I mean, chapter 1, Acts 1 and 7, Acts 1 and 8. When we look at the word salvation in Psalm 27, this word salvation in Psalm 27 doesn't mean deliverance from sin. This word means deliverance from danger and deliverance from a crisis. This word in Psalm 27 means safety and welfare. But of course, when we look at salvation in, in the New Testament, it talks about being delivered from sin because Christ has come. We are being delivered from the crisis of sin. We're being delivered from the danger of sin. We're being delivered from from all hurt, harm, and danger spiritually. But my point here is, regardless of what the word is and how many times the word appears, you have to go and look up the word. And I'm not talking about through a dictionary and I'm not talking about through Google. <laughs> Leave Google alone. Leave Alexis in Siri alone. Because we have an Alexis that's not a saved Alexis. Our Alexis, Brother Miles, is not born again. Alexis is so smart. Some Alexis can turn the light off, turn the light on. Some Alexis can tell you what the temperature is across the world. But when you ask Alexis, who was David? King David? I don't know that one. <laughs> that has not been programmed into my system. <laughs> you ask them, who is Jesus? 
she may say the son of God and leave it at that. But biblical words confuse Alexis and Siri. It, 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 it turned them totally upside down. It confuses them. Totally confused. Because they are not born again. So when we talk about salvation, we're talking about safety. We're talking about welfare. Okay, brother, we love power. Power. The first power in Acts chapter 1, verse 7. Uh, the first power has a strong number of G1849. G1849. So check that out. He just gave us a clue. G means Greek. H means Hebrew. The Old Testament is in Hebrew. The New Testament is in Greek. So if the strong number says G1849. One. 1849. 1849. 1849. G1849. Yes, sir. Go ahead. The, uh, let's see if I can pronounce this right. The Greek word for it is exousia. Oh, man, you got it. <laughs> okay. All right. Exousia, exousia, I've heard all kind of oars. <laughs> so exousia is close enough, right? And this word exousia, Brother Whitlock, means what? What does it tell us? A few things. The power of choice. Power of choice. Uh, the liberty of doing as one pleases. Okay, that means I got what? Stroll all the way to the bottom. When you get to the bottom, this word exousia, exousia, it means authority. That's why I said Sister Whitlock gave away my, my thunder. When you look at Acts chapter 1, verse 7, the word power means authority. Okay, now let's move to verse number 8. Remember, what is the Strong's number? So it's Whitlock. What's the strong number? 1840? 1849. 1849, okay. When we go to Acts chapter 1, verse 8, What's the Strong's number? G1411. G1411. There's a clue there. You have the same word power, but it has two different Strong's numbers. Therefore, the original Greek is going to be different. And the meaning is going to be different, as well as the usage is going to be different. Okay, Brother Whitlock, pronounce that word for us. The Greek word. This is past David's favorite word. And it's dunamis. 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 <laughs> and this word means what? Stroll all the way to the bottom there. It means power, strength. Strength, might. Mighty work. Mighty work. Miraculous power. Miraculous power. It is the same word. We get the word dynamite. Thank you, sir. If we get the word dynamite. So in verse number 7 of Acts 1, it is exousia or exousia. In verse 8, Acts chapter 1, it is deutimus or deutimus. In, in verse 7, it is authority. In verse 8, it is might and strength. And I always lay it out like this. The police officer has both the authority and he has the dynamite. His, his badge, his uniform says that he has the authority or she has the authority. But his taser, his gun, his blackjack says he has explosive power. Power to make damage happen. Power to be violent. Who's hand? Your hand up? Yeah. Yes, ma'am. So the word power. The word power. And Acts 7. Acts 1 and 7. 1 and 7 is different from It's different from the power in Acts 1 and 8. Yes, it is. Okay. Because we learned tonight, didn't we, that whenever it has a different 
Strong's number, it has a different meaning. And when it has a different meaning, we have to address it according to the meaning. That's why you hear your Sunday school teacher say on Sunday morning, now this word in the Greek means this. This word in the Hebrew means this. Have you noticed that they say the Hebrew when they're talking about the Old Testament? They say Greek when they're talking about the New Testament. We have some smart Sunday school teachers here. They don't do Saturday night specials. They start in the middle of the week or the beginning of the week, preparing for next week. And therefore, because they're studying and they don't, they, they don't, they're not scheduled to teach, they still study. Yes? So they're prepared. Remember, preparation is 90% of your presentation. Your presentation is only 10% of your actual deliverance. So we've discovered tonight that salvation means different things in different pericopes, different passages. We also discovered that power, even though it's in the same chapter, in two different verses, this word power means two different things, totally different things. Now let me show you this. There are places in scripture for it can be in the same verse, it means something different. The same word in the same verse means something different. None come to me right now. But therefore, you can't just read it because you read it and think it is there for the same reason. That takes me to the word, so that's word study, right? That's word study. We want to say what the author has said. We want to say it the way the author said. We want the meaning that the author has. The next word here is called exegesis. Now, exegesis, when we look at the text, how we approach the text, we want to exegete the text. We want the text to speak to us. We want to read out of the text. We want to hear what the text is saying. Have you ever seen a detective go to a scene and he take a screwdriver and put it to a pipe in the chemical plant when we were doing technician work and we think that a valve is leaking, we would take a screwdriver and put it to our ear and put it to the pipe. Or put our ear to the pipe with our hand and it tells us which one of the, pipe, which one of the valves in that pipe is, is, is leaking. Because when, when a valve is leaking, it makes a whole lot of noise. When it's wide open, it doesn't make that much noise. That tells me when a person, a Christian, is, is, is empty, they make a whole lot of noise. But a person that's full of the word can make a lot of noise. So this word, exegesis, number one, it gives us the original text. The word exegesis gives us the original text. And we have to read out of the text. In other words, the text gives us the explanation. We read out of the text. It is the original text. And it gives us the explanation. And the explanation determines the meaning. Exegesis. Someone spell that word for me. Exegesis. Real loudly. E -X -E -S -E -S -S. Okay. Exegesis. So it's, it gives us the original text. We read out of the text. It gives us an explanation in order to determine the meaning. Now there's another word called eisegesis. This word eisegesis is spelled E-I-S-E-G-E-S-I-S. Again, eisegesis, E-I-S-E-G-E-S-I-S. S-I-S. I tell you that exegesis means to read out of the text. Eisegesis means to read into the text. Eisegesis means to read into the text. That means you put what you brought to the text in the text. That means you take your background, 
your upbringing, your tradition, and impose it on the text. You make the text say what you want it to say. Prime example is 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verse 15. People will make the text say what they want it to say. We should not prevent those who are asleep. Oh, we should not hold them back. Oh, yeah. We should not hold them back. When we now know, as we look at the word and do our word study, now we realize that we should not read into the text. We read out of the text, and the text speaks to us, and the text gives us an explanation. So we, we want to exegete or exegete? Which one you want to do? Exegete. You want to exegete. We don't want to exegete because we make the text say what we want it to say. And we come up with our own meaning. But the author, when an author writes, the author is telling us something and we need to get what the author is saying. You ever been with somebody and they put together something and they always got five screws and five bolts and five springs left? They just isogeted that structure. I'm just, I'm just a firm believer that engineers know what they're doing. I believe, even if you don't understand it, the engineer put that screw in there for a purpose. Now, some of them give you one extra screw in case you, you but when you come up with five screws and it falls down in two weeks, you know why. When we look at the Bible, God gives us study methods and we need to use those study methods. And there are a lot of smart people, a lot smarter than I am, that have done this thing. So we want to exegete and not exegete. Last two words for tonight. Translation and transliteration. When we approach a text, when we approach the Bible, we want to make sure we translate Translate means to find the original meaning in the original definition. Should be another order. Find the original definition in the original meaning. And you do that from your word study. You do that from your word study. So when you translate, you find it. You find that word. What we've done tonight with 1 Thessalonians chapter 15, what we've done is that we have translated. We found the word, and the word is no longer prevent. That word means to, to that we will not go ahead, we will not go before, we will not proceed. Yes? We've discovered that tonight. So when you translate, you want to go and find those words. And you may have to do every verb, every noun, every pronoun in order to have a good understanding. And if you read other versions like we've read tonight, you will see that the author has already translated for you, meaning that he's found those words. But not only did he translate, he transliterated. That's what, what I am tonight. Transliterating means to substitute the old word with the new word. It means to replace the old word with the new word. So when you read King James, it says that those of us who remain alive will not prevent those who are asleep. When you new, use New American Standard, uh, New Living Translation, the English Standard Version, New American Standard, or International Children's Bible, it has already plugged those words in and come with a whole different sense. So when you transliterate, that transliteration means to go ahead and rewrite the whole passage or the whole, the whole uh, verse. And I told you, the book of Psalm, I mean, that was our thing. 1995, I got a, I got a three ring binder with nothing a three inch, three ring bounder with nothing but the book of Psalms in it. And we did it the long way. When we went to class, when we went to study, we went to our private chambers, we had this strong book, we had a Bible dictionary, we had no commentaries, 
And we may have an inner literary Bible and we may have an expanded version of the Bible. And all of it, we take to come up with the whole book of Psalms. So when I hear somebody teaching or reading a book of Psalms, it's going over in my mind over and over again from 1995, 96, 97. I want to close with, with a reading. Sister Davis, since you're the closest one to me, and we can use the same mic, I want you to come and read this Bible. This one is called the, the Emphasized Bible. It, it's the Inner Literary Bible. How many of you know the book of Psalm number 23? How many of you know that? I mean, how many of you just know that? Everybody in the room knows Psalm 23. So, Sister David, I want you to read every word, verses 1 through 3. 1, one through 6. Okay. It says, Yahweh is my shepherd, I shall not want. In pastures of tender grass, he maketh me lie down. Unto restful waters, he leadeth me. My life, he restores. He guided me in right paths for the sake of his name. Yea, though I walk through a valley death, a valley death shadowed, I will fear no harm, for thou art with me. Thy rod and thy staff, they comfort me. Thou spreadest before me a table in face of mine adver adversaries. Thou hast anointed with oil my head, my cup hath run over. Surely goodness and loving kindness will pursue me all the days of my life, and I shall dwell in the house of Yahweh evermore. Thank you. So we see, we see that the authors have already done our transliteration, right? He's already plugged in everything. He's already done the word study. He's done the translation and the transliteration. And he has exegeted the text. He didn't eisegete the text. In other words, he goes back to the original Hebrew text and he lays it out for us in the 23rd, 21st century. He just lays it out in 2023. Just for us. And so all these Bibles are now on my, my, um, my computer through one program called Logos, or Logos, or Log Logos, okay? And all I have to do is click a few buttons, and then I take my mouse and hover over the word. And when I hover over the word, it spit out a bunch of stuff over there on the side. Give me a definition, give me meaning, tell me how it's used, tell me how many times it's used, and tell me... And when preachers really want to dazzle you, they tell you, oh, this is used 25 times in the New Testament, 35 times in the Old Testament. None of it is really important to the person sitting in the pew to, to the change of the work, but he has that information there. Are you with me? So he has all that information, and now what I paid 360 some dollars for, now you can get it free. <laughs> because they have a layman's copy but then they still have a pastor's and preacher's copy. So the pastor and preacher's copy, 300 and nearly 400 some dollars already. And then every year you got to pay 40 to $50 of upgrade. Or to get all the rest of the books. But now I can show you how you can just log on Logos and, and get the abbreviated version. It's very much more extensive than my sword Bible. And it just gives you a plethora of stuff. Culture, background, customs, and all that. L-O-G-O-S. Whatever you do, download the free version. I just, just found out last week they got a free version. But they still want me to upgrade every year. And guess what I do? I upgrade every year. Because I contend that if a preacher's wardrobe is more expensive than his library, he's not doing great preaching. If a teacher's wardrobe is more expensive than his or her library, 
They just skimming the surface. Jesus didn't skim the surface. Jesus gave it all. On Calvary, he died. He was buried. He rose from the dead. God gave his very best. Jesus gave all. Now the Holy Spirit is leading us even in the 21st century. The door of the church is open. Imitation is extended. If you don't know Jesus, this is a good time to know him. If you haven't received Jesus as your personal Savior, would you just bow your head with me and invite him into your life. Believing on God's word and God's word says in John 3.16 that Jesus died and he rose again just for you. God's word says in Romans 8 and 9 that if we believe and confess that Jesus is the son of God and that he rose after he died, we will be saved. 1 Corinthians chapter 15 Verses 1 through 5 says that Jesus died, he was buried, he rose, and he was seen. The Bible says if you believe this story, you can be saved right here, right now. Would you bow your head with me and repeat after me and invite Jesus into your life? Say, Lord Jesus, I believe that you are the Son of God. I believe that you died for my sins. I believe that you rose from the dead. Now come into my life and make me a new person. Thank you for saving my soul. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. We believe that if you honestly prayed this prayer, believing that Jesus is the Son of God, that he died for your sins, that you're now born again, believing that he rose from the dead, and you are on, you are on your way to heaven. Thank you so much for joining us here at the New Beginning Church. Thank you for being a part of our service. Please continue to join us every Wednesday night for Bible study at 715. Join us on Sunday morning for Sunday school at 9 a.m. And then join us on Sunday morning at 10.30 a.m. for our regular service. It is now offering time. It is time for us to give to the Lord through tithes, offering, and sacrificial gifts. If you want to give electronically, you can do so by giving by way of Zelle. Our Zelle account is lifting.jesus at yahoo.com lifting.jesus at yahoo.com lifting.jesus at yahoo.com or you can mail in your gift to P.O. Box 503 Missouri City, Texas 77459 that's P.O. Box 503 Missouri City, Texas 77459 P.O. Box 503 Missouri City, Texas Seven seven four five nine. Thank you so much for joining us. Thanks for being a part of our service. Are there any praise reports or prayer requests? Any praise reports or prayer requests? If the Lord allows us today, Mr. to see one more day, she will be a real old woman, and she will she will be blessed of God. And uh, I will be qualified to receive SSI <laughs> from her. <laughs> so pray for Sister Davis to make it till tomorrow. It's her birthday. And, and Lord, my benefits will be rolling in, Sister R Richard. The benefits will be, she's a good catch, Brother Miles. <laughs> Amen. Thank the name of Jesus. So we say happy birthday to you. You want to play happy birthday for us so we can sing?
your name. We thank you for your mercy and your grace. We thank you for another chance, another privilege to study your word. We ask you to bless us, Father. As we go out, we pray, Father, that you bless us to reach souls for you. Bless us, Lord, that we will study your word, be children of your word, and bless your word, Father God, to fall on good soil. Bless us, Father God, to catch on fire for Jesus. Bless us to witness for you and bless us to evangelize the world around us. Bless us to build the kingdom of God in such a way that men, women, boys, and girls' lives will be changed. Bless our church, Father God, that our church will continue to be a beacon light for men, women, boys, and girls to see. Draw them, Father God, as we lift up the name of Jesus. Bless us, Father, that we will walk with you and we will never forget what you have taught us and where you are leading us. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen and thank God. Now unto him who is able to keep us from falling. Unto him the only wise and only true God. Unto him be power, glory, and dominion. Until we meet again, let us say together. Amen. Amen. We are uniting the church, strengthening families, supporting schools, and empowering neighborhoods to impact the world as we are reaching souls by lifting Jesus. Jesus said, and I, if I be lifted up from the earth, will draw all men unto me. John 12 and 32, you are dismissed. Thank you for joining us.